Hello, it's Rachel, and today we're going to cover topic four, observations and data collection. So when we talk about our last topic was operational definitions, um, we use those operational definitions so that we can t collect data. Initially, that's going to be our baseline data, and our baseline data is going to be conducted through an observation. So what does that look like? First of all, again, we have to start before we plan to observe a behavior, we have to define the behavior. Um, sometimes you can get a pretty good definition of a behavior by interviewing the people who have observed the behavior. So if you are um, not the person in the setting who sees the behavior on a regular basis, you are hearing it from other people, they can give you descriptions that can help you write an operational definition. Um, but you may have to tweak it when you actually see the behavior. Um, so sometimes it's helpful to do a couple of observations. One, to see the behavior in action so that you can write a really clear observation uh, operational definition and then a second observation to actually go in and count that occurrence of the behavior. Um, so you've got to write your operational definition so that two people can agree so that we can all take data on the same thing so that we are all talking about the same thing. Then you're going to need to determine where you're going to observe the behavior. Are there specific settings where this behavior is overly adapted and we want to decrease it? Or are there certain settings that need more supports where that learner needs more supports? So that's where we want to observe the behavior. Does, uh, you have to determine when to observe the behavior. Are there specific uh, times when this behavior is more likely to occur? And that is when you are going to take your data. How long are you going to observe the behavior? Um, we'll talk about like interval recording measures here in a minute. Um, are you doing sampling? Are you doing intervals? Are you doing continuous data collection where you're taking data on every instance? Um, if you are uh, looking at maybe a specific activity, does the duration of that activity change? Um, sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's 20 minutes. So how long are you going to record for your observation? You have to determine who is going to record the behavior. Um, while it may be ideal to go in and observe every behavior, uh, directly, that may not be possible. You may not be there when the behavior occurs. Um, it uh, Videotaping may not be a possibility because of all the permissions involved in order to videotape. So perhaps somebody that is already in the environment would be the one collecting the data. But you need to determine who's going to take the data. You also need to determine when are you going to start recording. Um, sometimes we look at maybe engagement with an activity and we don't want to start during the first few minutes because maybe it takes a couple minutes for everybody to settle into the activity. And instead we want to wait and start recording after they've already been in um, that activity for a few minutes. Or if you are working with an individual um, with who, for whom transitions are very difficult, maybe you want to wait until after a certain amount of time after the last transition before you start taking data on another behavior. You also want to determine where you're going to record um, the data. So not just where you're going to observe it, but are you going to record data across all of those instances or settings or locations, or are you only concerned with the behavior when it occurs in a specific setting? These are all things that you want to plan out so that you are consistent in how you're conducting your observation and your data collection. So how do we actually take data? Well, we talked about the quantitative measures of behaviors. So let's talk about how we might take data on those. So for frequency, you're probably just going to tally. You can do tally marks. You can use a golf clown counter to um, click and count those. Um, each click, each tally is one occurrence of the behavior. For duration, you're probably using a clock or a timer, maybe a stopwatch that has seconds, minutes, and hours in order to accurately measure that duration of the behavior. 
Same thing with latency, though generally if we're talking latency, we're probably talking smaller amounts. So you might not need hours for latency, probably seconds and minutes. Um, when we talk here, I'm going to skip uh, a little bit. When we talk here about um, intensity measures, we're generally going to rate those on a rating scale. So you would have a rating scale one through five or one through 10, you'd have each of those numbers outlined and you would write down the number for that intensity. Some other types of measurement might be product recording. This is traditionally how teachers grade paperwork in school, is everybody does their page, their homework, or their workbook activity. They turn it into the teacher, and the teacher looks at those answers as a product later that they can count later. So things like handwriting, or assembling something, um, making something, anything that leaves a permanent product, you could use a product recording measure um, where you look at it and you count it, you score it later. Um, you don't necessarily look at the behavior that's occurring, but you look at the product that it was the end result of those behaviors. Interval recording is going to be where you divide a time period into sections, intervals, and those are going to be the same length across your whole time period. So if I have an hour, I might divide it into five minute intervals or one minute intervals, whatever is appropriate for what you are measuring. And each time that the interval ends, you would record your data point. Um, well, that depends. So there's two types. There's whole interval recording and partial interval. For whole interval recording, at the end of the interval, you score whether or not that behavior that you were watching occurred for the entire interval or not for the entire interval. Um, if your uh, interval was 10 seconds long and the individual engaged in the behavior for 10 seconds, it would be a plus for whole interval recording. Um, if your individual engaged in the behavior for nine seconds, it would be a minus. It did not occur for the whole time. Um, whole interval recording has a tendency to underestimate the occurrence of the behavior because if my individual stops for even one second during that interval, I can't count it. So my end result would be uh showing that the behavior occurred um probably a little bit less than if it if we were just taking a full um continuous measure of duration across the whole time partial interval recording by contrast is if it occurs if the behavior occurs at all during the interval you mark a plus if it doesn't occur at all during the interval then you would mark the minus Partial interval recording tends to overestimate the occurrence of a behavior. So if my individual engaged in the target behavior for only one second out of the 10 second interval, I would still mark that the behavior occurred. But that means that my learner might have only engaged in the behavior one second in each interval for a total of 10 seconds across 10 intervals but it would look like a hundred percent if i'm using a partial interval recording measure so that tends to um, overestimate the occurrence of a behavior time sample or momentary time sampling is where at the end of the interval then you look up and you score whether or not the behavior is occurring at that moment it doesn't matter what happened before um, you're only scoring that moment is the behavior happening right now and across a long enough intervals right you can't just do like three or four or five intervals but across um, many intervals you would find that momentary time sampling is going to um, more accurately represent the occurrence of the behavior if you were using a continuous um, like duration measure Another opportunity or another uh, type of data collection would be per opportunity recording or sometimes called trial by trial data collection. Um, 
this is going to be where in your operational definition you have a very clear setup of when this occurs learner will blank 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 right then your per opportunity recording means that you're only going to take data when this setup occurs so for example if i wanted to take data on the learner following instructions to clap their hands i'm only if i'm doing per opportunity recording i'm only taking data when someone says clap your hands and then i'm recording yes or no did they clap their hands or you might have level of support level of prompt in there but i'm just recording when that instruction is given if they clap their hands at other times during the day it's fine. It doesn't matter. That's not my data collection. That's not my operational definition. So I'm not taking data on those. Ways that you might take data. So the old school way, <laughs> uh, paper and pencil, uh, big notebooks, lots of graphs, highlighting things all on your own. Um, now there are a lot of online data collection systems that might be used in private practice. Um, you might also use things like stopwatches or timers, you might use a golf stroke counter, or you might um, transfer coins or marbles from one jar to another to a, record the occurrence. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter how you take the data, as long as it can be accurate and everybody's taking data the same way. So, um, for example, I had someone describe to me a data collection system where they um, were doing uh, trying new foods and they had index cards and they had the learner's name on the index card because um, they worked in a small group. I think it was in a preschool setting and they worked in a small group and they'd present a food. And if the individual um, tried it, they would smear part of that food on the little index card with that kid's name. Um, if they uh, did not try it, they would bend the corner. Um, they would do different kind of actions with the index card and then and they'd move on to the other learner and then when everybody was done then they had those index cards that were now permanent products um, where they could go and they could record their data so oh there's a smear of food they took a bite oh there's a tear that means that they pushed it away oh there's a fold which means that maybe they just didn't do anything with that food right and then they could record the data so you can be creative um, and you can take data in a variety of ways that make the most sense for the setting. The most important part, parts, two parts of data collection is that it gives you the information that you're looking for and that the person taking the data can accurately use your recording system. So I could design a super fancy data collection system, but if the, uh, the person who's going to take the data doesn't know how to use it or it's too complicated to use in the moment, it's worthless. It, it doesn't matter how great my data collection system is. If the person taking the data can't use it, it, it's not helpful. So we have to design data collection systems that work in the moment for the learner, um, for the person observing the learner. We also need to make sure that the data collection process itself is not affecting the behavior. There's a few ways that we can do that. One is you can come in as an observer repeatedly until the person being observed becomes accustomed to the person who's going to be taking the data. That may take some time. We may not have um, the opportunity to do that, uh, letting the person get used to us first. Um, so this might not always work. But I know when I was in classrooms at the beginning of the year, we would go in and the first few sessions, we would just sit in the back of the classroom and we'd have our little PDAs out and we would pretend like we're taking data, but we're not taking data just so the kids get used to us being there and, and having little, uh, yes, back old school PDAs instead of uh, tablets or cell phones or anything like that. Um, you could alternatively record while hidden, so being in an observation room with a two-way mirror or um, recording with video recording. Um, again, that's not always an option. Not every environment has those awesome observation booths, and you can't always get video permission for, um, for situations or for individuals. 
Um, another way would be that the person providing the, uh, the treatment, the therapy, or the person interacting with the individual is going to be the one that's recording the data. So oftentimes, if we're talking about a classroom, the teacher would be taking data while also teaching the class. The TA, uh, teacher's assistant or paraprofessional that's supporting that individual would be taking data on the support that they are giving or the learner's behaviors throughout the day. Um, we're going to cover behavioral assessments in more detail later, but there are indirect assessments such as interviews, questionnaires, and rating scales that we might also use to collect some data. And there are direct assessment uh, that include recording the behavior immediately when it occurs, such as marking the behavior as it's happening and taking data on an ABC chart, which again, we'll go over all of those in more detail in future topics. So once you take your data, you also are going to need to represent that data in a way where you can easily analyze it. Most often we are graphing our data on a line graph so that we can look for patterns. So in case you're not already familiar with a graph, um, a line graph, the vertical axis demonstrates how high or low the behavior is during a particular observation. The horizontal axis is going to describe when the behavior occurred. So these might be sessions or days. Um, there are labels on the axis to tell us what we're looking at. There are numbers to provide the numeric value. Um, the data points are where those things cross. So on day two, it was 80%, so it's up here. On day three, it was 40%, so it's down here. And then um, we draw a line to connect the data points, except where there are phase lines. And phase lines or condition lines or phase change lines are going to be vertical lines that indicate a major change, either in the treatment, the intervention, or some other variable. Maybe it's a medication change. Maybe um, there's a life circumstance that happened that's possibly going to affect the behavior. So we want to mark that as a phase change line. So here's an example where we have aggression during reading. Um, we have baseline data um, and we have data points of 10, 11, 9, 10, 10, and 12. We have a condition line that signals we changed something. And in this case, we changed to using a token system. And we continued to take, um, this is frequency data because you have your numbers over here, frequency. Um, and we see that it is starting to decrease and it is decreasing and it ends up at zero. Now, one thing about this graph is that it has a floating zero. That can be helpful. Um, when you are trying to see where it's zero, uh, if you have zero uh, as a data point that occurs, because when it's on these lines, you might not see the data point as well, or you might not be able to see where there are gaps in the data. So sometimes floating zero is very helpful. Um, another example, this is percent engaged during reading. So we would have an operational definition that defined reading, and this is percent. So this is probably um, a momentary time sample or an interval um, measure. And we are going to see here that during baseline, it was between 45 and 55%. And then there's a condition line and now there is a self-monitoring program in place and our data is good, trending upward and ending um, looks like 90, 95 percent. Same thing, you're going to have this is the behavior um, measure on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis is going to be your uh, time. So for the assignments. Select three behaviors that your learner displays and write an operational definition for each. So just like in topic three, you're going to be writing an operational definition. If you are working with one learner, then you want to select three behaviors that that learner displays. If you're working with multiple learners, you could select um, a behavior for each learner. It, it doesn't matter, but three different behaviors. You're going to describe the when and where and how you're going to observe those behaviors. 
You're going to explain the data collection system that you're going to use. So you're going to need to describe it so that I could go in and observe that learner at that time and place using your data collection system. And we would end up with the same data, right? And then you're going to present baseline data for each behavior. Um, what I always have uh, trainees do is get numbers one, two, and three approved before you go out and take baseline data. When you are first writing your operational definitions, there might be some revisions that you need to make. And when you are planning an observation, there might be things that you haven't considered, or you might have to revise um, how you are collecting your data, um, especially if you have to revise your operational definition. So get all of those things approved, then go out and take your baseline data. Otherwise, you might end up taking some baseline data and then um, have to go out and take more baseline data after you make some revisions. Now, the behaviors do not need to be behaviors that you are targeting for reduction. They can be anything. Uh, this is baseline data. You're not manipulating this. You're not going to be changing these behaviors. You are just going to be taking data. So you could um, just take data on how often something is occurring in the natural environment. It could already be a skill that that learner has mastered. You are just practicing the data collection. So that was topic four, observations and data collection. Let me know if you have any questions and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks.